This will make more sense as we go through it, but Peterson chose to go full Jung in the coming sections of Beyond Order. Never go full Jung. This video made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi! Welcome back to the channel. In this, the second video for Rule 2, imagine who you could be and then aim single-mindedly at that, we are going to work through the first of the three sections of who you could be. And apparently this potential person that we could be is indicated through the chapter art, Alchemy and Harry Potter. Recall that in the earlier sections of this rule, Peterson tried to argue that stories are a tool to help you develop. That they can help people or societies change, as they are based on distilled observations of human behavior and therefore contain rules to live by. But these rules are not directly accessible, so we need to glean them from popular stories. And I think I may have just inadvertently illustrated one of the aspects of Peterson's writing style. That big picture summary I just did sounds totally fine that you can find inspiration to live your life better through stories. Sure, makes sense. But when you get into the specifics is where it gets less reasonable. Like his bringing in anamnesis, which is the idea that you don't really learn anything, you instead are remembering things you knew before you were born. While important for the historical context of how we think memory works, it isn't anything close to the modern understanding of how memory works. But contextualization for this concept doesn't occur in this book. If anything, he moves forward like it's currently a valid explanation, and maybe it is in Jungian circles, but not for people who actually study memory. But that's enough of the recap. Let's get the refresher for the visual cues indicating where ideas are coming from out of the way so we can dig into the art. This means I'm paraphrasing the book. This means that my attempt to get one cat in the frame isn't working, but it also means I'm responding to the book or integrating my thoughts with science. In the few places where I can, Peterson's citation game is pretty weak in this chapter. Like, there's just one, and it's to Jung, so. Uh, we'll also be multi-purposing this setup for the image analysis stuff that's coming. Woo! The problem I have with everything coming from Peterson in this video is what seems to be his explanation for why we're bothering with all of this symbology. Specifically, that the recurring themes or plot devices we see across media, across history, is somehow reflecting some hidden code locked in our unconscious. And if we can understand that code, we can hack our being. Basically, my problem is with the core of his first book, Maps of Meaning. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't sometimes overlap in myths or stories that may be indicating we may have a propensity towards describing things in certain ways, which possibly indicates something about how we think. But that is different from ascribing those seeming regularities to our collective unconscious revealing itself to us through these creative works. Come on. Come here, kid. Ooh, cute. Go. Go on your cube. Go on your cube. My mix. I would like to try my hand at explaining the meaning of the illustration based on an ancient alchemical woodcut that opens this chapter. Describing what it signifies reveals how much information can be contained within an image without the viewer possessing any explicit understanding of its contents. Such a picture is in fact better considered an early stage in the process by which such explicit understanding develops. The ancient alchemist who produced the picture was dreaming, in a very real sense, while doing so. Dreaming about what a person could be, and how that might come about. Before getting to that footnote and alchemy, because that is going to be a whole thing onto itself, let me just quickly say that a lot of information can be contained in an image. 
That's part of why Christian churches historically have all the art they do, to represent the stories that most of the attendees couldn't read for themselves. Thanks to Naughty Cat from my Discord, my apparent brain fart on doing the incredibly obvious thing to find out more about this image is only a little aside and not something I will be corrected on in the comments until the heat death of the universe. Peterson doesn't include anything for who the ancient alchemist behind the original of this image would be. Thankfully, searching for the one word in this image gets results. The wiki for Rebus has an image similar to the one Peterson commissioned for this book. If I'm putting things together correctly, the version of Rebus in the wiki page is a different artist version of the original that appeared in Basil Valentine's Azoth of the Philosophers in 1613. 17th century? Hardly seems ancient to me. Repeatedly calling him that doesn't manifest the timeline to make it so. And we'll get to what the heck the Rebus thing is in a second, but just the sound of it sounds like something you would challenge your friends to say in a public space with increasing volume. Rebus. Rebus. For fun and hopefully illustration, later in this video we're going to compare Peterson's interpretation of the implicit meaning of this image, mine, and Dr. Mr. the Husband's. Peterson is deep into Jung and symbology, which will almost certainly color his analysis. I read about tropes for fun during lunch, have a general understanding of classical mythology, took art history, and also took a super quick look into alchemy when a thing in Helsing got me briefly curious. My husband has none of that experience. Physics, he's golden, but this, not so much. We'll see what he has to say with no explicit understanding of its contents. I'll add that his response to me tasking him with telling me the meaning of this image was, quote, you want me to make shit up? Finally, how is a picture better as an early stage in the process in developing understanding? Better than what? Reading about whatever's to be understood? Having it told to them? Especially if someone doesn't understand the meaning baked into the image, how is it supposed to kickstart explicit understanding? Don't get me wrong, images can be useful in building understanding for different concepts, but it seems like you need to encounter the image along with the wordage for whatever that thing is. Without the greater knowledge context, the symbology that the image is using will be inaccessible and you won't get anywhere. That star is for a somewhat long footnote on alchemy. He describes it as the search for the Philosopher's Stone, a thing that would basically be an infinite money machine by turning stuff into gold, as well as making the alchemist immortal. He says that as alchemy developed, the focus became more about developing oneself rather than long life or wealth. As opposed to say as science developed, alchemy was driven into metaphysics. No, no, it was the alchemists who decided that immortality and money just weren't really all that important, not because it wasn't feasible. They wanted to do proto-self-help. His apparently all-encompassing reference here is Maps of Meaning. A nested reference? Are you fucking kidding me, Peterson? The book's PDF is 400 pages long. I am not digging through his dreams about his grandmother's pubes to find his discussion on Jung's alchemy right now. Although apparently it starts on page 16 and is followed by a substantially lengthier and style mad version of what's coming in this book. And for reference, alchemy shows up 53 times in Maps of Meaning and is sprinkled throughout the length of the book. My sense that Beyond Order is like the love child of Maps of Meaning and 12 Rules for Life may be more accurate than I first realized. In my quick skimming, I can't find that image or its source anywhere in Maps of Meaning. Alchemy! Yeah, this cognopsychologist is perfectly equipped to talk about that. Super quick and dirty version. Pearson's description of alchemy basically meshes with what various reference sites have on this topic. The basic theme behind alchemy is transformation of matter, of yourself. Its sister topic, astrology, is focused on the celestial bodies above, while alchemy is focused on the grounded stuff around us. Historically, there were several regional versions of alchemy, but Peterson's only talking about the Western. The Western version has some names we also encounter when talking about the history of science, like Roger Bacon or Newton. Given the chemistry involved, this isn't entirely surprising. In the late Middle Ages, alchemy was mostly centered on translating Old Greek, Roman, and Arabic texts. During the Renaissance, alchemy started its shift into the more occult focus while still working that free gold angle. 
The 1700s is where chemistry branched off from alchemy, given the growth of science and Wuish reputation of alchemy. There was an alchemical revival in the 1800s, which focused on the spiritual nature of the practice. A little later, this was adapted by Jung. I'm going to make an adaptation choice here. In the text, Pearson talks for a little bit about the image, has a sidebar into Harry Potter, and then talks about all the symbols in earnest. There is a lot of style-mad wordage about everything in the image and the deep meanings they have. I'm going to distill it so we aren't here all week with the minutia of it all. This is also where we're going to test how much meaning is implicitly understandable in this image. We are going to follow Pearson's order of ideas for the most part, though. He says in a footnote a couple pages later that in images like this, the higher elements are emerging from lower ones, and that images like this represent a process of psychological or spiritual development or growth, like plants, or how Buddha is depicted. And just as a note, I approach the image from the top down, and Dr. Mr. the Husband, in full ADHD form, didn't have a systematic approach to analyzing it. One strike against the universally understood meaning, and we haven't even really started yet. Peterson starts his assorted thoughts on this image by noting that it's contained within an egg shape and on the title of it. The egg shape is important because it, quote, indicates that the image is of many things inside one thing, a multiplicity in a unity. Throwing the symbology comparison in this format because it's not like we're going to be seeing any references anytime soon. Neither my husband or I caught on to the importance of the egg shape. Like, neither of us mentioned it in our image analysis. Whoops. Peterson says this image is, quote, labeled materia prima, Latin for the primal element. But there's no reference here. The book image isn't labeled anything, so I'm not sure where exactly this label is. Prima materia is the formless stuff that you start with on your way to making the Philosopher's Stone, which is the thing that'll let you make gold and or grant you health and immortality. I checked Maps of Meaning in case he's still leaning on that footnote reference for the image title here, but nope. He talks a lot about the prima materia, but this egg image is nowhere to be seen. There's this wolf thing, but that's about it. Most of the primal material discussion seems to focus on how this is the chaos egg that order can be pulled out of, similar to where Beyond Order goes next. The alchemists regarded the materia prima as a fundamental substance from which everything else, matter and spirit included, equally emerged or was derived. You can profitably consider that primal element the potential we face when we confront the future, including our future selves or the potential we cannot help upbraiding ourselves and others for wasting. It can also be usefully conceptualized as the information from which we build ourselves in the world, instead of the matter out of which we generally consider reality composed. Each interpretation, potential, and information has its advantages. To reiterate a point, keep in mind that alchemy shifted into a mostly philosophical pursuit as science became more advanced. Even commenting on the last part of this regarding the matter everything's made of. The lack of specificity alchemy's bringing to the explanatory party is only muddying the water. Thanks to the various sciences, we have a pretty good understanding of what things are made out of. There are still some details that need to be ironed out, but for day-to-day -day life, we have a pretty good handle on things. No need to invoke alchemy. But someone like Peterson could jump in and claim, oh no, don't you see? The primal matter is all of those subatomic particles. Alchemy still works. And actually, if we're splitting hairs here, it's a better conceptualization than something like physics or chemistry because we, as macroscopic beings, aren't working at the atomic level. And maybe, maybe, there is some practical utility in treating everything like an unformed blob instead of worrying about the actual mechanisms at play. But that isn't quite what we're doing here. I suppose you could break everything into the two boxes of potential or information. Not sure why you need to analyze the world through these two explicit particular lenses though, or what doing this buys you. His explanation for the utility of these two boxes comes by way of example. This time, you get some mail. Materially speaking, it's mail. So paper products with some ink on them. But Peterson says it doesn't really matter how the message was sent, listing off other alternatives like email, voice, or even Morse code. Just the content of the message matters. Except it 
does matter, for one, I don't know Morse code. So any message sent to me in Morse is going to be useless. Likewise, content in anything other than English is going to be basically undecipherable by me. So it does matter. And yes, I am being pedantic. PPE for this stuff includes pedantic pants. So the mail is a content container. You don't know if it contains good or bad news. Therefore, the envelope itself is, quote, a mysterious container from which an entire new world might emerge. No small X, still in play. Although this did give me the delightful mental image of Peterson retrieving his mail being as dramatic as light eating a potato chip in Death Note. I'll take a potato chip and eat it. He argues that everybody implicitly understands this idea and continues the mail example. If you're expecting something negative, getting mail elicits an instinctive stress response. You can confront the chaos hidden in the mail or put it off at your own, quote, inevitable psychological and physical peril. It is the former route that will require you to voluntarily confront what you are afraid of, the terrible abstract monster, and hypothetically, to become stronger and more integrated as a result. It is the latter route that will leave the problem in its monstrous form and force you to suffer like a scared animal confronted by a predator's vicious eyes in the pitch of night. Ah, we're back at the unknown chaos being a Schrodinger's amalgam of squirrel and tiger. Yes, I think you should deal with things, however difficult, when they come up. But I don't think it needs the shroud of alchemical mysticism. This is starting to seem like the Jung LARP version of those motivation apps that gamify your chores. Speaking of Jung, here's the cursory reminder that Peterson seems to have slipped in the psychodynamic concept of integrating oneself into this male talk. Super briefly, Jung put forward that your personality is composed of a bunch of subpersonalities pulled from an ancestral psychic warehouse. To be a happy, healthy, well-adjusted person, you need to integrate all of those subpersonalities into one because they can get snagged up by negative life events. For more detail, check out my Jung video. But enough primal matter chat, on to the specifics. At the bottom is the winged sphere. This thing is apparently the round chaos in alchemy circles. Triangles? Groups, according to Jung. As Peterson would have it, it's the undifferentiated unknown that is intrinsically interesting to us. I owe you a video on attention and how it works. Short version, there's a lot going into what grabs your attention and it's not this. And those numbers in the sphere? We're apparently not going to talk about them yet. Further elaboration on the flappy sphere comes from the ball sport in Harry Potter, Quidditch. And when I say elaboration, I mean a thorough description of the rules, positions, goal states, and so on. And in case you don't see where this is going, the Quidditch flappy sphere is equated with the alchemical flappy sphere. Why is Rowling's game conjured up for us by her deep imagination, structured in this manner? What does her narrative idea signify? There are two ways of answering these questions, although both answers relate importantly to each other. I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that my three-part answer that Rowling was looking for a way to flesh out the boarding school academic year sum, get an easy action scene, and also give Harry Potter a chance to be a Marty Stew isn't part of one of Peterson's answers. My memory for those scenes, either in the books I read or the movies I watched, was to basically skim or fast forward until those parts were over. It's sort of the equivalent of the pod racing scene in The Phantom Menace for me. Skip. Not surprisingly, Peterson's answers are nothing like mine. His first answer is linked back to Rule 1's game playing thing. The part he's bringing forward from the earlier discussion is that the true winner is the one who plays fair, because that is more of a win than winning. Since Harry Potter is a creative conservative, because he's able to break rules while following the spirit of the law, he is well suited to be the flappy sphere finder, as that position involves basically not playing the ball game while trying to find the super tiny sphere. The seekers of the snitch must ignore the details of the game of Quidditch, of which they are still a part, while attempting to find and seize the snitch, just as the player of a real-world game must ignore the particularities of that game while attending to what constitutes truly ethical play, regardless of what is happening on the playing field. Thus, the ethical player, like the seeker, 
indomitably pursues what is most valuable in the midst of complex, competing obligations. But the Flappy Finders are still playing the game, albeit a special subsection of it. It's not like everybody in that position is just a maverick, playing the game by their own rules. In this fictional game with fictional characters, they're still bound by the rules of play. If anything, the Flappy Finders could get Flappy fucked if they stop paying attention to the main game, since removing the Flappy Finders' ability to find the Flappy is part of the game's core strategy. Something Peterson even brought up in a previous footnote. Mark the date on your calendar, folks. Peterson's going two items deep into a numbered list. The second answer has to do with the Roman god Mercury for alchemists. Peterson says the Flappy Sphere was associated with Mercury by the alchemists because it's through, quote, what inspires or attracts interest involuntarily that we can get order from chaos. I'm trying to stay at the surface level with this, but look at this, I can't. Mercury was the spirit who possessed a person when his or her attention was drawn irresistibly to some person, situation, or event. Imagine that there are very complex processes going on in your mind unconsciously, highlighting events of potential worth and distinguishing them from everything else constantly unfolding around you. Imagine that these processes that distinguish value are alive, which is certainly the case, and that they are complex and integrated enough to be conceptualized as a personality. This is Mercury. You know, it's the damnedest thing. But you don't have to imagine that there are complex processes directing your attention without your conscious awareness, because there are cognitive processes that do exactly that. Yeah, I know I could be reading this uncharitably, but with the following line telling the reader to imagine these cognitive processes as living personalities in an integrated personality, I think I'm allowed to interpret the first imagine like I did. And how attention works, cognitively or neurologically, is amazing on its own. You don't have to dress it up in depth psychology. But we're back to the personalityification of things that happened in 12 Rules. All sorts of things and personalities, like ideas, morals, thinking in general, all sorts of things. Cognitive processes can now apparently be added to the list. But the problem of all these things being personalities is that the personality label has lost descriptive power. To not get terribly off track, mercury is important to alchemy in a couple ways. Chemically, mercury can be used to extract gold when mining. Alchemically, it was thought that the right combination of mercury and other stuff is what would get you your gold. Mercury the element was historically linked to Mercury the planet, which was linked to Mercury the god. The Roman god Mercury was roughly the Greek god Hermes. Hermes was syncretically combined with the Egyptian god Thoth in the Hellenistic period, and was tied to a series of alchemical texts that were important in the Renaissance's iteration of alchemy. Where were we? Right, Quidditch. The real-life Flappy Finders are the ones more willing to heed Mercury, who are playing the metagame of primary significance instead of normie mode. As a consequence, the Flappy Sphere is a container of primary significance, which will lead to revelation when sought after. This is elaborated on in a footnote about Alchemy's use of Mercury in trying to get gold relating to all of this ultimate development of the psyche or spirit or personality. Don't look at me. This is all one big deepity as far as I can tell. But Peterson's alchemy footnote neglects to mention that separating the gold from the mercury is a huge health hazard. One that still exists in the world today in some mining operations, but can't make an omelet without cracking some eggs, I guess. Eggs. The last bit before getting back to the image analysis is about not being able to pick what interests us. Instead, interests pick us. He argues that pursuit of interests, like say a romantic partner, forces informative growth in your capital B being. It can, sure, but by no means is it guaranteed. To roll with his example of romantic entanglements, the nice guy who is pursuing someone they love but immediately flips into burn mode as soon as they're rejected, doesn't really seem to be learning from the experience. Okay, so Peterson took the flappy sphere to be chaotic potential. I sort of blew my analytic load with everything above the flappy sphere, so I didn't have any guesses for its meaning. It didn't strike me as important as everything else in the image, although I was intrigued by the numbers. Dr. Mr. the Husband found it weird that the world had wings. 
When questioned what he meant, he explained that it would be a possible way for the world to float since there aren't turtles underneath it. He was also curious about the numbers since they are rather prominent. It doesn't seem like Peterson's proposed inherent collective meaning is really helping out members of this house so far. Moving up the image, Peterson next talks about the dragon. It's sitting on the flappy sphere because it is a dangerous manifestation of the chaotic potential, and dragons guard treasures. This indicates to Peterson that the drawing as a whole represents, quote, a psychological progression. First, you find yourself interested in something. That something, the round chaos, contains or is composed of potential or information. If it is pursued and caught, it releases that information. Out of that information, we build the world we perceive, and we build ourselves as perceivers. Thus, the round chaos is the container from which both matter, the world, and spirit, our psyches, emerge. Breaking the flow of moving up the image, Peterson says the numbers on the flappy sphere indicate this, as the three is associated with the spirit because of the Christian Holy Trinity, and the four with the physical world because of the four traditional elements. How do the numbers on the flappy sphere indicate any of that? And I understand we are deeply entrenched in metaphor in all of that, but this is giving me even more pause for psychologists who are coming at things from a Jungian background. Like, not just pause. We are taking the DVD out of the player and setting it aside so I can think about what it's done. Okie doke. Peterson's dragon is the manifestation of the, quote, interesting and meaningful and novel and unexpected, end quote, and danger therein. I assume the dragon had something to do with chaos, but only because I've been knee deep in lobsters for a couple years now. I don't think I would have gotten the chaos association prior to Peterson. I also took the figure standing on it to indicate chaos was being defeated or something. Dr. Monsieur the Husband took it to be a chaos snake, not a dragon. And the chaos element is probably because he's my script reviewer, so he's been waiting around in Lobster for the same time period. Continuing the journey up, Peterson's next stop is the Rebus figure. The Rebus is a symbol of the fully developed personality that can emerge from forthright and courageous pursuit of what is meaningful, the round chaos, and dangerous and promising, the dragon. So we become fully developed by chasing the dragon and the flappy sphere. Uh-huh, yeah, totally. It has a symbolically masculine aspect, which typically stands for exploration, order, and rationality, indicated by the sun, which can be seen to the left of the male head, and a symbolically feminine aspect, which stands for chaos, promise, care, renewal, and emotion indicated by the moon to the right of the female. It's probably safe to say fully developed is talking about a Jungishly integrated one, which fits with the shift in alchemy. Wikipedia is pointing the origin of Rebus to the early 1600s, although the idea of a unified masculine and feminine person is much older. Historically, the Rebus represents the end product of an alchemical great work. This is when you've made a divine hermaphrodite, uniting the spirit and physical into one although it's apparently one that's split down the middle, but who's counting? While some traditions do align order and chaos, or the sun and the moon along these gender lines, it's hardly universal. Also, it may be a bit of a patriarchal move to put order into the masculinity box. I know we've been just waiting around in Jung so far, but this next rebus part is Jung. In the course of normal socialization, it is typical for one of these aspects to become more developed than the other, as males are socialized in the male manner, to which they are also inclined biologically, and females in the female manner. Nonetheless, it is possible, with enough exploration, enough exposure to the round chaos and the dragon, to develop both elements. That constitutes an ideal, or so goes the alchemical intuition. This is referring to the anima and animus archetypes. The basic idea is that you have a subpersonality kicking around in your unconscious that's the opposite gender from you. In the process of individuation or unifying yourself, you would need to gain awareness and control of this archetype. To summarize my thoughts from the Jung video, no. Probably everyone has traits that are labeled as masculine or feminine in their culture, and that hedge there is to leave room for the existence of people who are 100% masculine or 100% feminine, which would be something to see. And socialization almost certainly impacts how a person's gender is felt and expressed. But the extra layers of complication that Jung's work is bringing to the discussion is unnecessary. 
It seems like Peterson's chosen some very precise language here, specifically the biological inclination. This isn't the one-to-one -one biological sex and gender argument he had previously made in a now-privated video. Biological sex, gender identity, and gender expression do not vary independently, and they don't vary independently. It's been softened to an inclination, which is an improvement as far as his take on trans and or non-binary people go, but still seems like he's catering to the gender critical audience while leaving plausible deniability about what he actually means. But of course, not a citation in sight for any of this. Meaning comparison time. Peterson sees the Rebus figure as an individuated, integrated person who has confronted chaos and come out on top, I guess? I was not familiar with Rebus, but did catch the two people as one, sort of, by way of Hedwig and the Angry Inch and the Origins of Love. I also focused in on the gestures of the two halves. It reminded me of the Raphael painting of Plato and Aristotle, where Plato is pointing skyward and Aristotle towards the ground, potentially reflecting differences in philosophical emphases between the two. Once Dr. Hubs got past the what the fuck elicited by the figure, and there was a fair bit of that because it's a split person with split clothes, he interpreted the one half as in a position to take a selfie, which could indicate narcissism. The other half has their phone down with uncertain intent. That implicit meaning seems to require a lot of explicit knowledge to understand. Closing out Peterson's image analysis now. Out of the unknown, the potential that makes up the world, comes the terrible but promising form of the dragon, peril and promise united. It is an eternal dichotomy echoed by the presence of the two remaining symbols to the right and above of the dragon's tail, Jupiter representing the positive and Saturn the negative. Out of the confrontation with peril and promise emerges the masculine and feminine aspects of the psyche, working together in harmony. Guiding the process is the spirit Mercurius, manifesting itself as meaning in the world, working through unconscious means to attract exploration to what will unite the various discordant and warring elements of the personality. This can all be read, appropriately, as a story of the development of the ideal personality, an attempt, an image, to describe what each of us could be. I guess we're taking the Venus and Mars symbols as red since he skips those here. I wonder why they aren't in the same order as the sun and the moon in the back. Although, if the symbols are red top to bottom, left to right, they are in the correct astronomical order. I also guess we're not going to talk about the masonry tools in the background either. In the original version of Rebus, the figure's holding the tools. The compass is used for circular stuff and is associated with the spiritual side of things. The square is used for squares and other bright angular needs, and is associated with the material world, which is somehow feminine as opposed to the masculine spirit. The other planetary symbols are present, I think, because they were associated with the other classically known metals. Venus for copper, Mars for iron, Jupiter for tin, Saturn for lead, and the Sun for gold, and the Moon for silver. These links were, and still are, important to astrology. How is Jupiter positive and Saturn negative here, other than Peterson saying so? because I am not seeing any sort of positive or negative connotations. Other than the Mercury symbol being up top, how is meaning being manifest in this image? How is this image, implicitly mind you, conveying a story of union personality development? Oh my god, it's also meta. The meaning of the image is implicit, which in this framework roughly means unconscious, which under Jung is all tied up in archetypes and other collective unconscious stuff, but to understand any of this, you need to have conscious knowledge of the unconscious, and this is all one Uroboros of Jung, forever eating the meaning interpreted into symbols as the symbols inherently containing that meaning. I think I just sprained my brain. Image analysis wrap up. Peterson sees this as reflecting the Jungian individuation process, basically. Given his depth psychology background, this makes sense. The best I could come up with was this being about conquering worldly chaos to achieve spiritual enlightenment. Dr. Mr. The Husband concluded with God being up top, or potentially the devil, he's not too familiar with the astrological planet signs. Humanity placed below with all its components, which is holding back the chaos of the world. Also, his final thoughts after hearing Peterson's description of things, quote, completely useless to integrate my psyche. So altogether, there are some thematic elements that we, people raised in the Western tradition, picked up on. But I will refer you back to what I said at the start of this section. These symbols and attached meanings do not exist in a vacuum. 
that we have some knowledge about them doesn't indicate they have almost mystical properties to help you life hack your way into a more positive state of mind. I don't really see how all the alchemy stuff indicates who we could be. Worse, all of that detail into the round chaos and rebus don't show up again in this chapter, quite possibly even in the book. It seems like it was a lot of words to indicate that personal growth can come from dealing with things that are hard or scary, which, yeah, agree. But that doesn't need to be buried in all of this mysticism. It sort of feels like he discovered Harry Potter in the interim between Twelve Rules and Beyond Order, caught on to the symbols that Rowling was using, and needs to make sure that everybody else understands that. But also that everybody else appreciates Harry Potter as a modern-day Christ story for all the sophisticated modes of being conveyed. What you doing? What you doing, bud? Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. But does any of this actually help people understand themselves or the universe better? It seems more like it's trying to shoehorn what's known into metaphysical metaphors, which ultimately doesn't buy us any predictive power. Anyways, as I said, I don't think any of this shows up again in this book, so hopefully you learn something about the history of alchemy and the symbols it uses and stuff, and yeah, until next time, bye!